All right, we're talking with Marine veteran Daniel Feliciano, CEO of Clothesline. Daniel, it's great to have a, a fellow Marine Corps pilot on the show. Don't get that very often. Uh, before we get to talking about business and your entrepreneurial story and Clothesline, all the great things you guys are doing, take us back and take tell us what you did in the Marine Corps. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, Dan Feliciano, I was a 53 Echo pilot uh, out of San Diego. So I joined the Marine Corps like you, uh, officer candidate school, came in, went through all the normal stuff, flight school, and then out to San Diego where I flew 53s um, with 462, um, the heavy haulers and the screw crew, as they call us, um, <laughs> did three combat tours. I was in... I was on the 13th Mew right when September 11th happened. And so we were scheduled to go out January. We ended up leaving in December. Uh, we went and floated around, got into some trouble in Somalia. Then we were over in Afghanistan for um, the big um, kerfuffle that happened um, in the Tora Bora region. I was up there for that. And then came back a few months later, went to Iraq. We were there, first helicopters in for the invasion of Iraq, was there for about 11 months, came back a few months later back to Afghanistan for a second tour. Um, and then I finished out my time as a flight school instructor in Pensacola uh, fixed wing, which was kind of fun to go helicopters and then come back and finish up my time as a fixed wing instructor. Uh, all that time I was, you know, same thing as most most Marine Corps pilots. I spent about a year or two in maintenance as an airframes officer, and then a year or two as an ops guy. And then when I was in the um, training wing, I was an um, ops guy there. So it was kind of fun. Awesome. Were, were you on one of the MUSE that uh, was the, the two MUSE that came together to form the, the MEB or whatever, and one of the first ones in, uh, invaded Afghanistan? Yeah, so we actually had, um, we absorbed a bunch of guys from another shitter squadron, another 53 squadron. They came mm -hmm. over, so we ended up reducing the number of 46s on in the squadron. We had twice as many 53s, twice as many um, Cobras and attack helicopters, so that when we went over there, we had heavier lift. We could operate at higher altitudes, and so, um, yeah, I think we had eight 53s and can't remember how many Cobras we had, but it was twice as many as what you would normally have on a Mew. <laughs> yeah, usually there was either four or six. They kind of went back and forth. So, yeah. Um, so we actually had helicopters on uh, everywhere, right? So there was <laughs> there we were all on the the main the main um, ship, but then we were like on the support ships. We had all the forty sixes everywhere. The guys were sleeping all over the place. It was <laughs> kind of fun. Crammed in, yeah, fun, fun. That's a good word. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. So you had an action-packed, uh, high operational tempo time there in the Marine Corps. What what was your transition when you got out of the Marine Corps like? Were you, were you planning ahead of time? Or I guess you were in flight school at that point and left from flight school. So were you, were you prepared to transition? And tell us about that. Yeah, I, I really wasn't. So I was, I was at flight school. Uh, I didn't think I was going to stay in for 20 years. I was like, you know, I'll tell you later as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, there's lots of great opportunities to learn to be a better entrepreneur in the Marine Corps, but it's also one of those things that like, if you have an entrepreneur mindset, it's not always the greatest <laughs> uh, environment. And so uh, I had been promoted to the major. I was pretty sure I was going to be a terminal major. And so at 10 years, um, I knew I needed to kind of transition out. I didn't know what I was going to do. And an opportunity at a major corporation opened up for aviation logistics guy. And so I applied kind of out of the blue. I ended up getting the job. So I ended up transitioning out of the Marine Corps straight into a corporate job at Royal Dutch Shell, um, where I ended up being the head of aviation logistics for continental United States. And then I went to Europe for a few years and I worked with a bunch of different companies, countries over there. And then I finished my time out in Malaysia. And so like that ability to move and be kind of transient that you learn in the Marine Corps translated really well to my time in the corporate world because every three or four years I was asking Shell where's my next place that I can go you know be successful yeah wow and so when did that come to an end where you know you talk you got this entrepreneurship thing you had the paper out as a young boy entrepreneurship's <laughs> always been in your blood you've always had that desire yeah um, when did it you got a really good job with a major corporation. Things are great. What, what's what's happening then? 
Yeah, so we um, the way it works when you're working at a big corporation and you become an expat is once you leave the United States, it's really hard to come back. Um, <laughs> you know, Shell's not going to hold your spot open. And so somebody fills it and then spots don't open up a lot. And so once you kind of transition to becoming an expat, uh, the whole rest of your life is spent being an expat. You just kind of bounce right. around from one country to another, um, hoping that a role will open up back in the United States, but it's really unusual. It's, it's similar like the Marine Corps, right? So things start getting much smaller as you get higher up in rank. And so like the number of jobs are a lot smaller. And so, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of times you have to transition to do something different if you want to continue to move up the ranks. Um, and so I found myself in that situation. I was out in Malaysia. Um, I didn't know where I was going to have to go after that Malaysia job was finished. Uh, my wife was kind of getting sick of being on the road for the last eight uh -huh. years, seven and a half years. Um, so we wanted to come back to the United States. She wanted to come back to the United States. At the time, my daughter also needed some special attention. Um, so uh -huh. my wife moved back here to get my daughter attention. I'm working over in Malaysia. And it's not like, you know, being a geo bachelor in the Marine Corps where it's God and country. And you're like, OK, I can do this because I'm serving a higher purpose like I was working for an oil company. <laughs> I was separated from my wife by, you know, a 24 hour journey. And so yeah. um, I ended up just saying, you know, I got to go. Um, I got to leave this amazing life that I had. And believe me, Shell is the most amazing company. I would work for them in a second if they would mm -hmm. have me back. Um, but it was time to go at that point. So we left. Uh, and now I was back here in the United States. I had really no job and it was time to figure things out. And you know, like as you had said, I'd been working since I was 12. I was a paper boy and and did that every day, 364 days a year, except for Christmas, hmm. uh, from when I was 12 until when I was 18. And then I joined the Marine Corps. And so, like, I'm a hustler, right? I work hard and I figure things out. Uh, and so I kind of got into the entrepreneur world just because, I, you know, this is where I was kind of headed my whole entire life, is figuring out problems and then building solutions to... Uh, solve those problems. All right, we're back talking with Marine veteran Daniel Feliciano, CEO of Clothesline. So, Dan, you had the big corporate job with Shell. You're overseas, can't get back to the U.S. You had to walk away from the job, get back to the U.S. And that's when you started coming up with the idea of you know, playing, playing around with entrepreneurship. So walk us through some of the things you did. Yeah. So, I mean, when we first moved back, um, you know, my initial part, part into entrepreneurship was really real estate. I came back, I bought, you know, I had some money saved up from working at the oil company. I bought a bunch of multifamily houses in the area where I live. And so then that introduced me to entrepreneurship because you have to figure out like, how are you going to manage these things and how are you going to grow mm -hmm. this? And what is the, what do the numbers look like? Um, and then, as part of that, I had hired a painter to come do some work at one of my houses. And I was like, hey, how much is this going to cost? And he didn't really know. And I was like, hey, I bet you I could figure out the painting industry too. So I put mm -hmm. together a business plan and I hired this guy and we we formed a company. And then I started this little painting company, which I grew mm -hmm. to like a million dollar a year um, business. And so mm -hmm. in the process of building that painting company, which ended up not being the greatest business, even though I grew it, it takes a lot of time to run a painting company. It's a lot like having just a bunch of Lance corporals and zero corporals in your life. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I I had this kid working for me this, who ended up being my co-founder, Camden. He was a college kid at the time. And one day I was complaining to him about how my whole entire life on the weekends is just eaten up with laundry. And Cam was like, yeah, I never do my laundry. The girls up at my university do my laundry for me for like five bucks. And so we started talking about, well, I wonder if there's a business there. And um, we did a bunch of research because that's the kind of guy I am. And we looked into the numbers and could we build something that connected people with laundry doers in the community? Um, kind of, you can think of it like a care.com type of thing. And so we built this marketplace um, where we let customers um, who have laundry demands in a local area connect with 
gig workers, if you will, usually moms, stay at home dads who live in that community, have some extra time, want to monetize their laundry machine. Um, and on our platform, we put those people together and uh, we started that about two years ago. And now we're in eight states across the country from Alaska to Massachusetts. Um, we got about 1500 customers and 500 people doing laundry. So it's been pretty fun. No kidding. It's laundry, man. It's not so much the doing the laundry, it's the folding of the laundry that's the time consumer, man. You remember, remember Iraq, Afghanistan? We had really good laundry. We had the best contract laundry. Like you just turn your bag in and get it back the next day, exquisitely folded, washed, dried, cleaned. I mean, laundry was laundry in Iraq, and Afghanistan was awesome. <laughs> It's like you're getting shot at and rocked yeah, and everything it's... else. But man, the laundry was great. <laughs> it was free for us, of course. Yeah. And, and that's exactly the same model that we have. I often think back to like putting my mesh bag out on the boat. We are, I was on the Bonham Shard. Like you put uh, your mesh bag out on the boat and, this, and like the Navy takes it and a day later it comes back soaking wet. But it's the yeah, navy laundry so, on the boat is a totally different experience. It's the worst. It's, it's the like worst. you hand them the mesh bag, and they hand you a mesh bag full of. Un, it's just it went through the washer and dryer and never came out of the mesh bag. It, so yeah, I don't know. It, and half the time it's still the, wet. Yeah, you wonder I don't if think it, it went even... through the dryer. I just think it goes <laughs> through the washer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so, a totally um, different story. But um, I remember at the basic school, there were when we get libo for the weekend there were guys that are like what are, you, what are you doing this weekend oh i'm gonna stay here and do laundry like all yeah. weekend really i'm going to dc or or uh, woodbridge or georgetown or i'm going up there friday afternoon not coming up till sunday man yeah what about your laundry yeah. i turn it in at the back gate at the at the asian the asian gals that have owned this laundry place they do all your laundry for you and it's great and it's like you know it costs like a little bit of money i mean it wasn't it was an expense, of course, but it freed it freed you up for the whole weekend, you know? Yeah. And you'd hand them nasty clothes being out in the field and sweat and everything and come back, everything exquisitely folded and dried. And all you had to do is put it back in the drawer. It was great. And then um, my wife and I had four teenagers at one point. We discovered every one of them was using a different towel every time they got out of the shower. And it was yeah. like, like there was like one, one weekend, my like one weekend, my wife did like 16 loads of laundry and it's just, yeah. and my wife does really good laundry. She's very good at it, but 16 loads in a weekend. And then we, here we are again. She's like, I'm going to be doing, I can't do anything all weekend. I got to do all this laundry. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. All right. Let's, let's load it up in trash bags. There's a laundromat down the road. We're going to take it down. It was like 120 bucks, but it was like five big trash bags full of laundry. And we yeah. dropped it off and picked it up like the next day all done all folded it was like the best money i ever spent it totally like gave my wife her weekend back you know yeah um, so you're kind yeah. of talking about something similar to that that's exactly what we're talking about it's all about getting people's time back right yeah. so i mean laundry is one of those pain points that every single person in the world has and if you've ever had the opportunity like we have to outsource it to somebody, if you can do that at a price that's reasonable for most people, which our main priority is providing this service at a price that's reasonable, then you've really eliminated a pain point that almost every single person has. And, and it's such a time suck for your weekend, for your family. And like you said, it may not be that you don't mind putting it in the washer and the dryer, maybe it's like the folding. I hear all the time people are like, oh, I hate putting it away. The thing about it is once you have somebody else do it for you, all those other pain points, they go away, right? So like yeah. we have somebody do our laundry because we're, we own the company, but when it comes back, we don't have any problem putting it away. Whereas before when we had to do it, it would just sit there folded until I wore it, right? It never got back <laughs> into the drawer. Um, and so now it gets back into the drawer because that's the only part of the laundry that we have to do. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, and like that whole concept of bringing it to the laundromat, we've eliminated that by having the clotheslines, the people who do the laundry, pick it up at your house. You would you would have just left those bags on your front porch and somebody would have come and picked them up. And a day later, there would have been new, brand new bags on your front porch with clean clothes. And you wouldn't have had to wow. make that extra trip to the laundromat. 
Okay, so you you came up with the idea because one of your kids, a college kid who was painting for you, said something about I have girls at the college do my laundry. So what what, what were they doing? Like you just making a deal with other people in the dorm or? Yeah, so he was in a fraternity, right? So yeah. like he had sorority sisters that were like teamed up with fraternities. I don't know. I didn't hmm. go to a school that had fraternities, but um the way he tells the story is you have like sister fraternities and stuff and yeah. you know they would have a working relationship about how the laundry was going to get done and um it was that concept of people monetizing their time and the assets that they already had available to them that really intrigued me the most and as we built this company it was crazy how many people we spoke to that said that they made their way through college by doing people's laundry that that's really? how they made extra money during school. And so it's it, when you talk to people about laundry, almost every single person has a story about laundry. And oh, yeah. um, and so it was it's this natural thing to build and to kind of expand on. Um, and then, you know, really what we're also doing is offering this opportunity to people to make a little bit of extra money. And generally, 80 percent of our clothesliners are women. Um, and up to this point, they really didn't have an access point into like the gig economy that, uh, other people that men generally have, because they don't want to be Uber drivers. It's like a safety issue there and they don't want to be out doing other people's grocery shopping. And so mm -hmm. now they have this opportunity to make a little bit of extra money at home, kind of monetizing their free time and they're providing a service for other people in their community. And so. It really kind of resonates with me as a former Marine officer where we have this amazing community and like the esprit de corps. And we're trying to build that same kind of community aspect here around laundry and helping other people out. Yeah, it's like one of the everybody wins kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. So. So how does it how does it work? Like what um, go through from if somebody wants to get on board to do people's laundry in if somebody wants to get on board, having somebody get, get you know, do their laundry for them. Yeah, so it's all app-based, right? So if you are going to be uh, a customer, you would download our app. We have an app on both Android and iOS. We also have a web access portal if you don't have a phone. Uh, and you would just go on there. You create an account. You tell us how many bags of laundry. Uh, uh, we do bags and not pounds. So if you took a 13-gallon garbage bag that everybody has in their kitchen, you know, a tall garbage bag, fill it up with as much laundry as you possibly could. That's 20 bucks for it to be picked up at your house, washed and folded and returned within two days. And if you want it in one day, it's 25 bucks. And so uh, generally that comes out to a little less than a dollar a pound if you jam it full, uh, which is like 30% less than what a laundromat would charge you if you actually had to go there and drop it off yourself. So from the customer side, it's super simple, it's about five steps. Download the app, create your account. Five steps later, you put your laundry on your front porch and it's done. From the clothesliner side, uh, it's also app-based. Download the app. We have a full training program embedded in the app. We have some training and then our clothesliners do a test run. We walk them through setting up an account. And also one of the things that's different from us than other people is other gig economies is we give our people an opportunity to build a little book of business. And so instead of it being like an Uber model, it's more like I said, a care.com model. So you have mm -hmm. this person, let's call her Jennifer. She can have her own space on our app. And so if you want to outsource your laundry to Jennifer, you choose Jennifer. And then every single time you and Jennifer now have like a little business going back and forth between each other. And so we help them build that. We show them, how to be successful, how to load their profile on there, how to write a compelling story about themselves, and then how to manage that business on there. And then that's it. They just wait. You come on, you place an order, you choose Jennifer, Jennifer accepts it, and then Jennifer comes and picks up the laundry and does it and returns it. So um, it's all ex as simple as we could possibly make it. Um, nobody like wants complicated laundry. Yeah, that's yeah very... You know, seamless and painless as much as possible. So yeah. um, one bag of laundry is essentially one load other than the fact that you might have to separate the colors from the whites. Yeah, so that's about what it is. And if you want to separate, so generally a bag of laundry goes in together. Um, 
if you want it separated, it's like a dollar more or something to separate it just because you have to have some extra laundry detergent or so so on. Mm -hmm. But you can you can ultimately um, personalize it on our on our app as well. And that's one of the reasons that like having gig workers do this is that you can really do anything you want. So if you want it separated or you want it hung dry or you want one thing folded a certain way or whatever, you can do all of that because you're working with another human being and you can just talk mm -hmm. to Jennifer and be like, Hey, Jen, I need this and this, then, you know, it might cost you an extra couple of dollars, but then Jennifer, who's like a real person, not a business. She's like, yeah, I can do that. You know, I can figure all that stuff out. And, and then you just talk with her and you kind of work out the situation. And then as Jennifer does more and more loads, she gets to know you and your family better. And now like she separates your clothes from your wife's clothes. So it come back in different bags and makes putting everything away easier. Um, the point of creating the relationship is that things should become better and better as you move along. Wow. And where, where is it available anywhere in the country at the moment, or are you limited in uh, certain towns and cities? Yeah. So we're mostly in the Northeast, New York, mm -hmm. New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Uh, we are in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. We're in reno and las vegas and nevada and we're in anchorage alaska and, and a lot of the it sounds a little random but it's all because we were building out the model testing it against different kind of demographics and uh -huh. different kinds of cities um, like what kind of and, things do you have to have in place in order to open up a town or city like is there is there any regular regulatory items or is it just a matter of do we have enough people there yeah, there are some regulatory stuff. We tried to minimize the regulatory stuff that is required by, you know, for example, we don't do things by the pound because if you charge by the pound, you have to have a certified scale. And the, uh -huh. the chance of you getting a certified scale, you know, that. by some random person, she's like one of our clotheslines isn't going to take their bathroom scale to the New York State certification <laughs> way station and get it certified, right? Uh, so. Really? Uh, so huh. like all those little things that might be regulatory, we tried to eliminate the need for any of that. Um, and so uh, we built this program so that it was scale, scalable across the country uh, without having to worry too much about um, some of the regulatory issues. And so generally, when we open up a new market, it's just, hey, we're going to open up this market. We have to find clotheslines first, the people who are going to do the laundry. And once we get them on board, then we just start marketing word of mouth mom's groups are really great for us yeah. <laughs> facebook mom's groups so do you have any like uh case studies like uh like like your number your number one laundry doer and um like how many loads of laundry are they doing and like i don't know what kind of numbers you're willing to share but like uh yeah like, um you know, like, like uber is like doesn't like with uber like doesn't the driver get like 80 percent, and the company gets 20 or they vary off of that or something like that yeah, I, I think Uber drivers wish it was like that. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, generally our clothesliners will do um, between three and four customers a week is is the sweet spot for them. That that's mm -hmm. where they that's where they have like the most opportunity to make some money, but also for this not to be a full time job because it's not for anybody, right? Everybody mm -hmm. on our on our platform is just looking to make some extra money. Um, and so three or four customers per clothesliner is what you're generally looking at. Um, and that's usually like a, like a general orders, two bags. So we're talking about eight bags of laundry is what our clothesliners are generally doing per week. Mm -hmm. Um, we have some that are super clothesliners where they may have like a business account where they've created a relationship with a small business in their local area and mm -hmm. they'll do more, but it really is up to them to decide uh, how much they want or don't want within the the marketplace. Um, customers generally order um, two to three times a month, which is pretty fun. You know, so we have some, some a subscription base, um, which is you know every week. But we also have some customers that just kind of order once or twice or three times a month, which you know is just something to help them you know save some time as they move forward. Yeah. And is it usually the person that's doing the laundry? They're the ones that drive to the customer's house and picks it up and drops it off? Yeah. So the clothesliner is responsible for the entire life cycle of the order. So once okay. the order comes in and the clothesliner accepts to do it, um, then they're responsible for the entire life cycle. We provide overhead support. So we do customer service. We do payment. 
you know, processing. We do pay out to the clothesliner um, processing on their behalf. And then also if there's a discrepancy. So instead of a 13 gallon bag, you take one of those giant black garbage bags and you fill it up with laundry and you say it's only one bag, then it's our responsibility to help out the clotheslines and make sure that they're getting compensated properly. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really are here to support the clotheslines. Um, you know, you can think of it just like we were as pilots, right? Everything that the Marine Corps does is to support, you know, the guy on the ground. And mm -hmm. that's kind of how we look at clothesline. Everything that we do supports the clotheslines and, and how they're making money. Are you... What, what level of detail you went? Well, the thing I'm really curious about is like how much can a clothesliner typically expect to make from a load of laundry? Yeah, so they make um, 75% of the total order. So whatever okay. the order is, uh, they make 75% of that. Plus they make 100% of the tips um, and then they make 75% of, um, of any add-on money that comes through on that. Okay, cool. Now, how many are you willing to share? Like how many customers and clotheslines you have on board at this point? Yeah, so we have um, 500 active clotheslines on board right now. We okay. have um, 4,000 customers on our platform. Wow, so, that's awesome. Yeah. When did, when did you good. guys actually, I know you had to build the app and build it all up, but like when did you guys actually start? Like if, if you have an official start date. Yeah, so we had an MVP out in 2021, which is, you know, it was not nice, but it was just to start, right? It was in our yeah. local area. Will this thing work? I think our official, like, real launch date was January 2022. So we've been in business okay. for two years and a few months now. Yeah, uh, that's a big, that's a, have you hit that hockey stick ex expansion point? Or is it pretty much linear so far? Uh, it's pretty linear. We, it's a yeah. it's a scale game. So once we get to a certain scale, then we'll be able to kind of move forward. And we have a, a really high retention rate, both on our clothesliner side and our customer side. That's cool. And so the hockey stick will be once we get to a specific point in our scale. And how did you, like initially, how did you get it going? Like how do you socialize the idea? Did you just capitalize on the college relationship that already existed possibly or? I'm curious, like how, or since then, what's what's been the way you typically bring on clotheslines and customers? Yeah, no, our real kind of aha moment was when we figured out that the real customers were um, were women who were responsible for other people's laundry, whether they had a laundry machine or not. So think about your wife and all of those, all that, you yeah. know, those towels. Uh, college kids are not good customers yet, so <laughs> they think. They think in like beer math, right? And so you're like, okay, this load of laundry is twenty dollars, and that'll be like clean clothes for a month. But they're like, but that twenty dollars is also five beers, and so do I want the five beers or do I yeah. want the clean clothes? Um, <laughs> but but women or men who are responsible for laundry for other people, they think about life and time and how much yeah. time they're going to be able to save. And so once we figured that out, then we just needed to put ourselves in the places where those people are. And so what we started to do was, um, you know, really be able to focus where we spent our time marketing and where we spent our time um, promoting our company. And we found out, you know, like we need to be in these areas because this is where our customers are spending their time. Um, and then one of the things that's very interesting, you kind of touched on it already, is um is that this this laundry concept has been ingrained in like the women's thought process like we like so many times we hear oh my wife did this or my wife does the laundry and and so like and women when we talk to them a lot of times they feel almost this um like this like this belief that is their responsibility to do the laundry and so mm -hmm. trying to crack that belief trying to convince them that like their husband stopped mowing the lawn like 20 years ago and even though they have a lawnmower in their garage doesn't mean that they're going to mow the lawn like that's the same way they need to look at the washing machine like just because you have a washing machine in the house doesn't mean you have to spend your weekend doing laundry right your, mm -hmm. your husband's out playing golf you should be out doing whatever you want to do on the weekends <laughs> um it's a tough oh, yeah. nut to crack though <laughs> that's awesome uh well hey dan we're getting close to the end of our time so um 
first of all, how do we, if we're interested in get, learning more about Clothesline, how do we find out about it? Yeah, so you can go to clothesline.com. It's spelled with an L-Y-N instead of an L-I-N-E. So it's uh, C-L-O-T-H-E-S-L-Y-N-E. Um, and you can look at our blogs. You can kind of see how we do things, see if we're in your area. If we're not in your area, send us an email. Um, like I said, it doesn't take us a whole lot for us to open up a new area and we're, and we're in expansion mode anyways. So I'm happy to come out and help anybody in any space where they're at. And, you know, um, also just talk laundry. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Well, hey, uh, Daniel, thanks for sharing your entrepreneurial success story. Um, I'll give you the last word. Usually I like to say that now that you had a great career in the Marine Corps and the corporate world, you're full-blown entrepreneur now. Um, if you're talking to somebody that's getting out of the military soon or just recently got out in the transition, what kind of advice comes to mind when it comes to entrepreneurship? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that people coming out of the military need to know is that you're coming out of an environment where everybody that you work with is really good at what they do and they're highly skilled and they've been highly trained. And if you go into the corporate world or you go in, out into the regular world, most people you run into are not going to be like that. And so my like my one piece of advice is don't become average just because everybody else outside of the military is average. If you stay sharp and like and fierce, then you can be super successful outside of the military. But if you come out and you're sharp and you let yourself become dull because the rest of the people that you're dealing with are dull, you're never going to, it's going to be very frustrating time. So just stay sharp, stay fierce, stay focused, and you can really, really win outside of the military. Awesome. That's sage advice there, man. That's great. Never heard anybody say it that way. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, appreciate that. All right, Daniel. Well, thanks for sharing your entrepreneurial success story. Uh, look forward to seeing the future success of Clothesline and, you know, maybe maybe a year or so when you guys are blowing it up and hit that hockey stick uh, scale milestone, uh, we'll get you back on the show. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'll come on anytime. All right. All right. The, these two Marines are Oscar Mike. Thanks. <laughs>